There is constantly data being collected on you. Whether it's Instagram, Facebook, your computer, your cell phone, your tablet, YouTube, or even your GPS location. All of this data is constantly going somewhere and being stored somewhere. It's pretty scary. So I'm Kylie Ying and today I'm here in collaboration with Free Code Camp and I wanted to talk about the ethics in data science and collecting all this data, running experiments on it, and so on. Before we get started, just a quick shout out to OpenDS for all because they provided us with these awesome slides that we adapted for this talk. OpenDS for All is a project created to accelerate the creation of data science curricula at academic institutions. Data science models affect every single aspect of society. Now, whether that's admission to schools, who to hire or fire, work schedules, who to date, whether to grant a loan, what ads are shown, what discounts are given, what news and social media posts you see, like all of these things are dictated very often by data science models. There are also many news stories and books about data science and ethics. Although there are more problems than there are solutions, there are lots of new and interesting research directions being pursued by data scientists, which we'll point to throughout this module. And this, this module is just kind of a short introduction to the ethics of data science. It's a very big problem that we're dealing with today because we have this unprecedented amount of data and we're just trying to figure out what is the right thing to do with it and how to effectively use this data while staying true to what is you know ethically correct. OpenDS for All also points to an excelled edX course on this topic that they recommend and I will link it in the description below. A good data scientist needs to understand the ethical issues surrounding the data that they obtain or use, the algorithms that they employ, and its impact on people. In this talk, we'll discuss what exactly do we mean by ethics, the ethics surrounding data, which includes privacy and informed consent, ownership and intellectual property, as well as ethics surrounding models and algorithms, such as biased algorithms, bad results from good data, fairness, and reproducibility. So why do people do the right thing? Well, first of all, there is an aspect of morality or ethics. And what are ethics? Ethics are the rules that we all voluntarily follow because it makes the world a better place for all of us. They are the cornerstone of civilization. Ethical principles stop me from stealing your car. Laws also stop me from stealing your car since I could get caught and put in jail. However, there are also non-legal consequences that are a factor. I might be unsuccessful and you would beat me up. But ethics also go beyond laws. If you told me a secret and I agree not to tell it, but do, that's not a crime. But it might damage my friendship with you, and it might damage my reputation with others. Again, non-legal consequences might be a factor. Part of the problem is, what is the right thing? Sometimes it only becomes evident in retrospect, such as you know a naive action that led to bad consequences. But such experiences and consequences are exactly what shape our understanding of the future, our policies, and our laws. For example, many rules regarding data ethics are highly influenced by medicine and human subjects. When ethics aren't laws, laws often follow ethics because ethics are our shared social values. And laws are often created to enforce these social values. For example, when spam mail first arose, it might have seemed like a good idea. But after some time, it became clear that it was not. And laws have been put into place to govern them. Okay, so let's talk about the ethical principles around data. So it really falls into four different categories. There's autonomy, the right to control your data, possibly via surrogates. Informed consent, where you should you know, explicitly approve of your use of data based on your understanding of what it's gonna be used for. Beneficence, which is people should be using your data for your benefit and non-maleficence, which means do no harm. And much of the ethical use of data is actually shaped by human subject research. 
Now, how do people get this data? Well, data collection. Data is constantly being collected about us, whether it's your cameras, your cell phone location reporting, your accelerometers, social media, click-throughs, or even your cookies. And questions that really get asked are, do I own the data that gets collected about me? Or what if I don't like what my data says about me? And how can I control how this data is used? There's actually been a lot of recent discussion about all of these questions. For example, the EU's data protection law, GDPR, gives individuals a right to ask organizations to delete their personal data. In human subjects research, there's a notion of informed consent, which means that somebody must understand what is being done, voluntarily consent to the experiment, and have the right to withdraw consent at any time. But this isn't really required in an ordinary conduct of business, which might mean A-B testing on Facebook. But this is a very fine line. So what are the implications for data and informed consent for organizations such as Facebook, Google, etc.? We'll look at some examples next, which serve as the basis for this direction. All right, the first example is this Facebook mood manipulation experiment. Basically, in 2012, researchers at Facebook and Cornell manipulated the newsfeed of select Facebook users. Some users were shown more positive articles and others were shown more negative or sad articles. And it turns out people who were shown more positive articles posted more positive articles themselves on Facebook and people who were shown more negative articles posted more negative articles. And in other words, they demonstrated this like emotional contagion. Now, was this legal? Facebook didn't ask anybody if they wanted to be a part of the study. Their terms of service said that users relinquish the use of their data for data analysis, testing, and research. And there was also a statement by Facebook which basically said that this research was conducted for a single week and none of the data used was associated with a specific person's Facebook account. And they do their research to improve their services and make the content that people see on Facebook as relevant and engaging as possible. A big part of this study is to understand how people respond to different types of content, whether it's positive or negative in tone, news from friends, or even information from pages that they follow. And Facebook basically claimed that they carefully consider what research they do and have a strong internal review process. There's no unnecessary collection of people's data in connection with these research initiatives and data is stored securely. But was this ethical? Well, Facebook social psychologist Adam Kramer had basically said, at the end of the day, the actual impact on people in the experiment was the minimal amount to statistically detect it. And having written and designed this experiment, he is basically saying that the goal was never to upset anyone. In hindsight, the research benefits of the paper may not have justified all of this anxiety. So there are several issues with informed consent with data. First, the terms of consent are frequently difficult to understand and buried in fine print. Most of us ignore the terms of usage and just click through. Second, it is difficult to control how data, once collected, could be used in the future. It's difficult to keep track of how it is copied and reused. Also, most people just ignore the terms of usage. Okay, another experiment is this OkCupid okay experiment with customers. They had a love is blind day where they suppressed photographs in user profiles so customers could not see profile photographs of potential people to meet. Instead, customers could still read what was written in profiles, such as interests, which had the effect of having longer conversations until these photos were restored. However, they also had some other experiments, such as taking people with a low compatibility score and telling them it was high, or vice versa. Or this 3x3 three three test matrix, 30, 60, and 90 compatibility score actually versus 30, 60, and 90% declared. And in this experiment, people felt that they were being deceived. Now, was this legal and ethical? 
The past CEO, Christian Rudder, said, but guess what, everybody? If you use the internet, you're the subject of hundreds of experiments at any given time on every site. That's how websites work. And indeed, Google does change rankings. Facebook does A-B test user functionality and recommendations and so on. But on the other hand, having a company intentionally lie to you and give you a wrong score, well, that's actually something that many people consider socially unacceptable. Now moving on to intellectual property. Big data sets are very vague about how they are protected. Patents only protect implementations, not ideas. Artistic expression can be copyrighted. Exclusive legal right to print, publish, perform, film, or record, and authorize others to do the same. Derivative work can also be created with permission. There's like a notion of citation, which we give credit to the owner. But what about data? I mean, there's Wikipedia, Yelp, Rotten Tomatoes, TripAdvisor. There's a clinical data set, a company's data, your gene sequence. And what does it reveal about people? So there are lots of cases where your data influences what service you get. Your insurance company may put a GPS tracker on your car and give you different rates depending on whether you're speeding or other driving habits. Companies might also look at your data on your Facebook page. For example, here, I mean, this company, Admiral, is pricing car insurance based on Facebook. In another example, Cambridge Analytica claim to have won the White House for Donald Trump by using Google, Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Intensive survey research, data modeling, and performance optimizing algorithms were actually used to target 10,000 different ads to different audiences in the months leading up to the election. And these ads were viewed billions of times according to the presentation. Privacy is a basic human need. Privacy is not black and white. It is an exercise of control. Loss of privacy occurs when there's a loss of control over personal data. In 2016, Danish researchers publicly released a data set of around 70,000 OkCupid users. And this included their usernames, age, gender, location, what kind of relationships they are interested in, personality traits, and answers to thousands of profiling questions. Did they attempt to anonymize? The researcher's response was, all the data found in the data set are or were publicly available already. So releasing this data set merely presents it in a more useful form. But was this OkCupid data public? The data was acquired by screen scraping, a methodology that's not fully explained. And it's likely from an OkCupid profile that researchers created. OkCupid users may also restrict the visibility of their profiles to logged in users only. And it's likely that the researchers collected and released profiles that were not intended to be publicly viewable. So privacy is not simple. There are many rules governing the use of this collected information. For example, HIPAA, FERPA, and GDPR. But information leakage can lead to unexpected disclosures. There's also this idea of privacy by trust versus privacy by design. So another example is license plate readers. Cities are increasingly using automated license plate reader technology. Camera systems are ubiquitous at malls, train stations, and airports. They appear at intersections and on the dashboard of police cars. This information can be used to create a very detailed picture of drivers' whereabouts over time. Much of this information is not important for fighting crime. Apart from the loss of privacy for individuals, this information could actually be used for many different bad reasons. And even an identifier such as a license plate number is not involved, there are questions about how and whether data collected can be used to identify individuals. For example, there's this de-identification case study. AOL user number 4417749. 
Basically, the question that we're asking here is, is removing identifiable information from data, such as name, phone, address, sufficient to protect the identity of individuals? Well, AOL user number 4417749, identified as Thelma Arnold, based on search history. Basically, your search history was landscapers in Lilburn, Georgia, several people with the last name of Arnold, and homes sold in Shadow Lake Subdivision, Gwinnett County, Georgia. There was also another incident in Massachusetts about some insurance. The General Insurance Commission released de-identified health insurance, but Latanya Sweeney used the zip code, birth date, and sex to locate the health record of the then governor, William Weld and she was able to look up his diagnoses and prescriptions. This event was pivotal in, res in revisions to the HIPAA privacy rule to restrict disclosure of full birth date and zip code under the safe harbor standards. Even when there is an anonymized data set, there's such thing as correlating data. So Netflix once held a competition where they released a de-identified data set with the user ID, date, movie name and the rating given by the user for that movie. Researchers were actually able to link the users with IMDb's system where the users were identified and they talked about some of the movies that they watched. The problem here was the sparsity of the data. So in Netflix data, no two profiles are more than 50% similar. If a Netflix profile is more than 50% similar to a profile in IMDb, then there's a high probability that the two profiles are the same person. Okay, now let's talk about this idea of differential privacy. So when do you feel safe releasing personal information such as completing a survey about your tastes in movies? And this question of how and whether data you release is safe for example, what, you know, whether or not you can be identified using the release data is a topic that has been well studied in the computer science community. One notion that has been formalized is differential privacy, whose goal is to provide as much statistical information as possible from data stored in a database while guaranteeing that an individual cannot be identified. Differential privacy ensures, for example, that a person will contribute their genetic information to a medical database without fear that anybody analyzing the database will be able to figure out which genetic information is hers. Or even you know, whether she has participated in the database at all. And it achieves the security guarantee in a way that allows researchers to use the database to make new discoveries. Ideas from this research are now finding their way into practice, such as the US Census Bureau or Google, among others. Differential privacy aims to maximize the accuracy of queries from statistical databases while minimizing the chances of identifying its records. It basically adds noise and provides guarantees against a privacy budget. And finally, let's move on to the ethics surrounding algorithms. So algorithms are not neutral. Algorithms encode our biases. Training data, not usually representative, past population is not representative of the future population and overfitting to underrepresented data is very common. So there are a few different ways that we get bad results from good data, which we'll discuss. There's often correlated attributes, misleading results and p hacking. So an example of correlated attributes, Staples decided to win business from their competitors by offering a lower price online to customers living near one of their competitors. However, Office Max stores happen to be located in higher income areas, not rural areas or poor neighborhoods. So if you live in a poor neighborhood, you ended up paying more than somebody living in a wealthier neighborhood. Staples was not intending to offer better prices to people in higher income areas. They were just trying to compete with Office Max. But there was a correlation between income level and where Office Max stores are located. Data can also be represented in a very graphically misleading fashion. 
So here, it appears that there is a dramatic increase in interest rates from 2008 to 2012 in this graph on the left. However, if you change the y-axis to actually start at zero, it's not so dramatic a change. As another example, here on the y-axis, it shows how different types of database management systems have changed in popularity leading the viewer with the impression that graph databases are the most popular. However, relational databases in red at the bottom have been around a long time and are very popular. However, their popularity has not changed significantly over this time period, and they continue to command by far the largest market share of these systems. The graphic is misleading since it leads you to believe that relational databases are losing with respect to NoSQL databases. And of course, there's also p-hacking, where you know sometimes the p-value is used in the context of the null hypothesis testing in order to, to quantify the statistical significance of evidence. In null hypothesis testing, a claim is assumed to be valid if its counterclaim is improbable. There's something called p-hacking, which is a term coined in 2014 by Regina Nezzo in Nature. It is the misuse of data analytics to find patterns in data that can be presented as statistically significant, dramatically increasing and understating the risk of false positives. This is done by performing many statistical tests on the data and only reporting those that came back with significant results. It's basically like saying, hey, go try a million things. If one of those has a significant result, then come back and you know we'll talk about it. But of course, you're trying a million things, so it's just probabilistically likely that one of them will have a statistical result just based out of luck. And so there's this emerging area called FAT, which stands for Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency. Algorithmic systems contain inherent risks, such as codifying and entrenching biases, reducing accountability, and hindering due process. Being able to quantify and reason about issues of fairness, accountability, transparency, which is related to reproducibility, has emerged as an important research area. And in the next few slides, we'll give some examples of issues seen here. Fairness has been something that's been studied very much in depth in social choice theory, game theory, economics, and law. Currently, it's pretty trendy in theoretical computer science. There's the idea of discrimination against an individual, which, you know, an individual from the target group might get treated differently from an otherwise identical individual from not that group. Or discrimination in an aggregate outcome, so the percentage success of the target group compared to the general population. And it's very important for algorithms to be fair. I mean, you know, you have to classify people in ways that are consistent with common sense notions of fairness. For example, we wouldn't think it's ethical for a bank to offer, you know, one set of lending terms to minority applicants and another to white applicants. But recent work has shown that discrimination that we reject in normal life can actually creep into algorithms. Suppose you had a minority group in which the smart students were steered towards math and science and a dominant group in which the smart students were steered towards finance. Now, if someone wanted to write a quick and dirty classifier to find smart students, they might look for students who study finance because the majority is much bigger than the minority. The problem is that not only is this unfair to the minority, but it has also reduced utility compared to a classifier that understands if you're a member of the minority and you study math, you should be viewed as similar to a member of the majority who studies finance. Individual fairness is also not enough to ensure group fairness. For example, suppose you are looking at college admissions and you're thinking about using test scores as your admission criteria. If you have two groups that have very different performance on standardized tests, then you won't get group fairness if you have one threshold for the standardized test score. And for a lengthier discussion, you should read the book, The Ethical Algorithm, The Science of Socially Aware Algorithm Design by Michael Kearns and Aaron Roth. 
Another example of the lack of algorithmic fairness are the algorithms frequently used in sentencing and parole, which generate a score predicting the likelihood of an individual committing a future crime. However, it's not clear that the algorithms used are predictive and they seem to show racial disparities. For example, ProPublica obtained the risk scores assigned by one such algorithm to more than 7,000 people arrested in Broward County, Florida in 2013 and 2014, and checked to see how many were charged with new crimes over the next two years. They found that the score proved remarkably unreliable in forecasting violent crime. Only 20% of the people predicted to commit violent crimes actually went on to do so. When a full range of crimes were taken into account, including misdemeanors such as driving with an expired license, the algorithm was only somewhat more accurate than a coin flip. They also discovered significant racial disparities. In forecasting who would reoffend, the algorithm made mistakes with black and white defendants at roughly the same rate, but in different ways. The formula was particularly likely to falsely flag black defendants as future criminals, wrongly labeling them this way at almost twice the rate as white defendants. And white defendants were mislabeled as low risk more than black defendants. Generally speaking, transparency means that data as well as information describing data collection methods, raw data, and research analyses should be made available. This enables the reproducibility of research results. However, this is hard to achieve since algorithms, and in particular machine learning algorithms, are frequently complicated and it is often difficult to understand the dependencies between code and data. Furthermore, sometimes the algorithms might be black boxes, which makes it impossible to open them up and reason about results and there may be privacy issues associated with the data and it can't be shared. So to facilitate reproducibility, the FAIR principles have been proposed as a guideline for those wishing to enhance the transparency of their data and research results. As opposed to other initiatives that focus on the human side of things, these principles put specific emphasis on enhancing the ability of machines to automatically find and use the data in addition to supporting its reuse by individuals. Now, FAIR stands for Findable, Accessible, Interoperable, and Reusable. There's a lot of ongoing research in how to facilitate reproducibility, especially with respect to provenance, understanding the why and where of data. Examples include providing provenance tracking environments for different execution environments such as Jupyter Notebooks or R Markdown source documents, and understanding provenance through machine learning operations. So in summary, the codes of conduct for research are fairly well understood. I mean, there are these things right here, but do we always follow them? Well, that line gets a little bit gray sometimes. And fairness is more subtle. What is fair treatment of a group? Is it, you know, judged by equal accuracy or equal false positive rate? And the key technical aspects to take away from this talk are differential privacy, which, you know, bounds the amount of information to be revealed, data provenance, which means that you can track, you know, how you've modeled your algorithms, and the trade-off between optimizing outcomes versus avoiding discrimination against a group. Thank you guys for listening to this talk and once again a big shout out to OpenDS for all for providing these materials. See you guys next time.